in, not from astronomical bodies, but apparently from, from some kind of early phase of the universe. So the, the, the hypothesis is simply that the Big Bang, when it occurred, emitted an immense amount of light. And initially the universe was opaque because it was all charged like a plasma and light couldn't get through it. But as the universe cooled, at some point atoms started to form. The, the charged electrons and protons that dominated the universe at that time started combining into atoms. And suddenly the universe, I mean, <coughs> by suddenly, I mean over a period of, 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 of sort of 100,000 years, uh, and this is all happening about 380,000 years into the life of the universe. The universe cools and suddenly it becomes transparent to light. And since then, photons have just been marching towards us, as it were, uh, to be picked up 14 billion years later by our satellites. But in the interim, the universe has been expanding. So it's a bit like, it's a bit like we were standing in a sort of, this is a, not a, brilliant analogy, but it's like standing in this room and there being a, terrible, a really strong mist, so light isn't getting anywhere, but say this mist is generating light, but it's immediately scattering and what have you, and then suddenly the mist goes and there, there's light just propagating in all directions, and we're sta we, we happen to be standing at some point in this room, and the, but the room is expanding, and it's expanding very rapidly, and that expansion actually literally stretches the space in which these photons, these light rays, sit. And it stretches them and that lowers, uh, increases their wavelength, it lowers what we call their temperature. They, they cease to be as high energy. Originally they were from this incredible explosion, very high temperature explosion, but over time they just, the space gets stretched, and it gets stretched by about a factor of a thousand. And that stretching means that these photons which used to have wavelengths that were extremely short have actually lengthened out and they've lengthened to a sort of few millimeters, which happens to be the, length, the wavelength of the radiation that we call microwave. So this is the afterglow of the Big Bang. And the thing that really strikes you about it is it's an amazingly homogeneous. Now the chaps that did this picture, of course, they're really excited about these small fluctuations, but red being slightly warmer, blue being slightly colder, they have removed a lot of astronomy from this. There are a lot of foreground things, including our own galaxy, which make a real mess of this plot, if I was to show, sh sh show you that. So this is, the, this is the final plot after you've got rid of all the, the, the stuff that might be interesting to, to other people, but these guys are just interested in the fluctuation of the uh, temperature of, the, of the, this microwave glow, this cosmic microwave background. Um, these fluctuations represent one part in 10 to the 5. So, so, so a sort of a hundred thousandth of, 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 of the overall temperature, and this overall temperature, it, these microwaves represent the black body spectrum you'd get from an object which was only 2.7 Kelvin, but the, these fluctuations are at the 10 microkelvin level. Now what's interesting is you would immediately say, look, this is a snapshot of the universe 380,000 years in, and that what it's telling me is that the universe is inhomogeneous at a level of one part in 100,000. So clearly, gravity, you know, sucks. So what happens is if that represents the sort of inhomogeneity of the material in the universe, then all we have to do is wind the clock forward 300, from 380,000 years to 14 billion years, and we get what we see today, which is these, you know, galaxies, clusters of galaxies form very nicely. Just because, you know, if you, if you happen to have a sort of nearly uniform field of material, and it's all self-gravitating, then the, the areas that have a little bit of an overdensity will, will, over time, will tend to accumulate. The material, and that's how the you know that's how the structure comes about, right? Well, no, because if you start with an inhomogeneities which are only at the level of one in a hundred thousand, even though you give yourself 14 billion years to evolve, you miss by about one to two orders of magnitude, a factor of 10 to 100. That there is way too much structure today, you know, the galaxy. That that would not work. That would not work. And Gravity, if you like, is what's known. Most of this structure formation is, is in the regime of what we call linear. It's very easy to predict. Um, I mean, I know it gets a bit gnarly when you really get down to stars and things like that, but an awful lot of this gravitational instability, this infall, is very easy. So it's not a mistake in the, in, the, in the theory, in the calculations. It's just, it's just that this snapshot has to be wrong, right? Or that maybe when we took this snapshot, we weren't taking a snapshot of most of the mass in the universe. What we're doing here, as we suggest, is we were just taking a picture of the flotsam and jetsam that is this baryonic material I talked about, the protons and electrons. Maybe the, the really the dominant mass in the universe was doing something else. And it's the dominant mass in the universe that is really responsible for the gravitational infall and the, and the structure we see today. 
And that's where this theory of cold dark matter came about from a cosmological perspective. You need to suggest that there was something back here earlier than 380,000 years, maybe uh, sort of 50,000 years, really getting its skates on in terms of making structure, that it's beginning to evolve in homogeneities. And by the time 380,000 years comes by, it's already getting really quite inhomogeneous. It's, it's, it's at least an order of magnitude more inhomogeneous than, than we see here. But because it's neutral, and it's, you know, it's weakly interacting with the conventional material, the conventional material just does its thing. It, it, it poses for this nice snapshot. But, but the cold dark matter was really doing the work of forming the structure. And that's a beautiful theory, and I, I, um, I'm going to show you a graph in a minute of just how well it works. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, forgive me, but I've got to show it to you because it is such a nice... Well, so that's it. So that's it. Basically, cold dark matter, it's doing its thing well before the cosmic microwave background sort of decoupled, if you like, or uh, from the explosion. And, and so that's why CMB can't see, at least not directly, the, the, the structure. So what, what I'm plotting here, and this, you know, this is hardcore physics, and we get excited about this, but all, all I'm plotting here is logarithmic graphs. So this, each one of these guys is a factor of 10, factor of 10, factor of 10. But, you know, physicists don't get out of bed for anything less than a logarithmic graph these days. Um, uh, this, this is, this is uh, uh, I, we've labeled it wavelength, and sorry, but, but really it's just distance. And it's distance measured in megaparsecs, and I, you know, I, yeah. so that's millions of parsecs, where a parsec is, you know, three and, three and a bit light years. So it's millions, so if you think of that as millions of light years. And actually, um, usefully here, sort of this kind of scale here is, 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 is on the kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the cluster scale, and over in this direction, this is really big distances, so this is scale of the universe uh, distances, and over here is getting smaller and smaller down towards a sort of cluster, sorry, galaxy, you know, over towards, ga uh, you know, it's a galaxy level, really over here. And what this is, is, is we've actually measured the amount of lumpiness in the universe at various different scales. Now, it turns out we can't use a single technique to do that, we have to use multiple techniques, and that's actually all these different colors are different ways of measuring the degree of lumpiness of the universe at various diff distance scales. Um, and they all agree. It's extraordinary. They all agree with one another. Whether, whether you use... Um, no, I'm not going to listen. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to watch the time. I, I, sorry, I could go ahead and list the various techniques, but I, but I won't. What I really just need to say to you is, is that those techniques are all agreeing. And this this magenta line here is, is a theory based on cold dark matter. And that kind of agreement is just fantastic. And, and uh, if you take um, other um, theories and try to fit this, you know, basically cold dark matter just blows everybody else away in terms of the accuracy or the, you know, the agreement we get between the measurements we're making and the, uh, and the theory. And that, for, for any theory, is, is, is very good news. So that's, that's really, from a cosmological point of view, one of the reasons why we, we are very keen on, on this, this idea. Does this give you any idea as to the characteristics of the cold dark matter? Uh, well, 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 you see, from a cosmological point of view, you really can't say very much. It's just, sorry, the re ah, I didn't tell you yet. Sorry, the reason I refer to it as cold, sorry, I should have said this, I, thank you, <laughs> um, it is cold. The cold just simply means it, whatever it is, it's not moving terribly quickly. And our definition of terribly quickly is going to be the speed of light. Mm -hmm. what, what's interesting is if, if it was made of something that tended to propagate very quickly at the speed of light, then on small scales, so this is small distances here, galactic scales, cluster scales here, this is the size of the universe over here, but on smaller scales, the faster this dark matter moves whatever it's made of, the more it makes parts of the universe communicate, if you like, and, and what that turns out to do is to wash structure out. It tends to make things very homogeneous. Uh, and what that does is drives this down. This is a measure of the inhomogeneity. So this is sort of maximum of these sort of length scales here, hundreds of megaparsecs, uh, were, you know, in maximum in inhomogeneity. But it would wash this. So what would happen is if the, if the whatever the, this dark matter is was moving very quickly, it would simply um, uh, uh,